Hi everyone. Um, I'm Gino. Before we start, I'm just gonna explain a little bit how this uh, how this platform works. First of all, thanks for uh, for joining this webinar. Uh, I'm Gino. I've been working for Fermentis for three years. Um, I have a background in uh, chemical engineering and biotechnology. Uh, I did my PhD on food nutrition and biotechnology. I've been in the brewing world now for a little bit over eight years. Um, I know a lot about fermentation and cell metabolism. So I hope uh, during the cycle of webinars, which I will come to later, uh, I'm, I'm able to, you know, share some of the of the of the great results we we had. Uh, share a lot of research and give you more insight in, uh, you know, how you can change fermentation uh, to your needs to, 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 you know, to get the beer exactly that you want to brew. So the presentation is around 45 minutes and then we have uh, always room for questions. Um, it's best because we are with, with uh, a lot of people that you leave the questions for after the presentation. But if you have an urgent question, you can just uh, type it in the chat um, uh, or uh, and, and ask uh, Alar. Uh, um, he will ask the question to me, so I cannot hear you uh, in this uh, in this platform. Uh, but uh, another thing is, uh, Alar can also give you live access. So then he will click uh, some buttons, and uh, and you will be uh, 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 entering the room, so everybody can see you and and hear you ask the question. I hope that's clear for, for everyone. Uh, I now give the word to Alar. So you can also ask uh, the question in Estonian because Alar will, will translate it for me. Um, Alar, the floor yeah. is yours. I'm Alar from Brulmeistid. I think everybody should already know me. I'm official partner with Brulmeistid uh, of Fermentis in Estonia. So you're welcome and, and uh, Welcome, ask questions, and I will forward it to uh, Gino. Okay. Well, thanks. So, in preparation of, so what, what the plan is to do a, a cycle of uh, at least eight webinars every week at this time in Estonia. Um, so I just came up with some uh, some program uh, that I think is very interesting for you. We start a little bit, uh, um, I would say more general, but uh, with important information about quality, about shelf life of yeast, we'll do that today. Uh, and then from the second webinar onwards, we'll do um, really, uh, I will share uh, scientific data to give you more. It's planned now, if you have other topics you want me to discuss there's always room for that uh, at the end of the of the of the webinar cycle because sometimes i need to prepare uh, for instance i got a question in in sweden because i'm doing the cycle of webinars in uh, in whole northern europe with all uh, all the official fermenters partners and uh, so a question i got for instance from sweden was uh, what's the impact of counter pressure on flavor development and that's something that we did not research, so I have to do a little bit of my own research uh, to share uh, my ideas on, on, on a topic like that. But it can be anything uh, relevant for you. If you have questions about other uh, things uh, related to fermenters yeast, you can always uh, contact me via email. And my, my address was uh, at the start of the presentation. I will share the presentation, I will send it to Alar and he can put it online. Uh, so you can always uh, look back. Um, most likely, uh, uh, we will also uh, share the, this live presentation uh, later on. You can always access it because you registered, so um, it, it will be recorded. So if you want to look back, uh, it's, that's always possible. I will also share the, the links for that uh, with, uh, with Alar. So... Um, Next week, I will talk about uh, rehydration versus direct pitching, uh, then impact of temperature, pitching rate, and original gravity on the flavor profile of beer, where I will focus on, uh, on lager and, and ale yeast. Then how we 
how we work in selecting the best yeast for a certain beer style. I will talk about uh, New England IPA, the work that we did there. How come we advise certain yeast for a certain style? Um, the next one will be on Brut IPA uh, and then yeast and single hop interaction. So it's, it's a bit more academic. Then low alcohol beers with LA01. Cattle sour beers with Seth Sour, which is a, quite a new product for us. And then uh, creating permanent haze in beer with the Spring Blanche. And then there's room, as I mentioned, for, for your topics. So let's start with the first one. <clears throat> I'll, I'll give a short introduction on, on where we are. So you are here. Uh, I'm just going to check if I can bring up the pointer. Yes. So you are here in this beautiful country, Estonia. Uh, we are here on the border uh, between France and Belgium. We're just across in Lille, um, which is a very nice city. If you ever have the opportunity to visit, please do. They have great beer lineup uh, in all the pubs because we are so close to Belgium. Um, our production facility is in Ghent. Uh, I, will, I will show it obviously in more detail uh, later. So it's in Belgium and all the brewing yeasts are produced in this uh, in this factory. In total, actually, uh, the, the La Safra group has uh, uh, 63 factories worldwide. So it's quite big. Uh, La Safra is still a family company. Um, so it's uh, it's 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 still small in terms of you know personal contact. Uh, uh, we find that very important uh, to be able to provide the service level that we and that we want. Um, most of the factories are focused on yeast for bread making or pizza or, or whatever, uh, because that's always in the liquid cycle. And as you will see later, for brewing, uh, we focus on dry yeast, mainly because it's logistically far more easy to transport on a global scale than, uh, than with liquid yeast. So uh, the La Safra group has different business units and we are in the, the unit that focus on the fermented beverages. Um, they rebranded the name last year. So it was always Fermentus uh, La Safra by uh, La Safra for beverages. Now it's Fermentus by La Safra to basically highlight that it's still owned by the family La Safra. So we work not only for beer, uh, although in this webinar I will mainly focus on beer, uh, we, we also do uh, uh, yeasts for wine and, uh, and other products for wine, cider, spirits and, and potable alcohol. Um, obviously in this uh, webinar I will focus mainly on yeast, but later on I will also show uh, some things about the bacteria and yeast derivatives in, in the later uh, webinars. So let's talk about yeast first. As a short introduction, yeast is, a, as most of you will know, is a sexual organism. It's quite small, four to eight micrometers, but still uh, a lot bigger than, than bacteria. It belongs to the fungal clade. And later on in the, in the follow-up webinars, I will go into more detail on you know, how, the, how does that work, the sexual reproduction, uh, how do we use it uh, to generate new yeast, etc. In nature, um, it's estimated that there are around 200,000 different uh, species of yeast. But if you look on the industrial level, you know, which ones are actually used for, for brewing, it's only a very small portion, like a few hundreds, maybe, maybe a thousand uh, strains. But that's about it. Um, there, are, there are not many strains actually in nature that are uh, suitable for, for making beverages. So if we just check the brewing, uh, classic brewing yeast, you have two varieties. Uh, I guess most of you use both. So you have the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the ale yeast, which is the top fermenting yeast. So uh, it floats to the top. If you crash, it drops, uh, obviously, um, and with different properties. So some yeast drop fast, some, some yeast drop slow. Normally, it's in warm conditions, so uh, above, I would say, 18, 20 degrees. Um, on the other hand, you have the Saccharomyces pastorianus, which is a hybrid yeast. I will discuss this hybrid in, in a later seminar. Uh, 
it's bottom fermenting and it prefers a little bit colder temperature so let's say all from 12 to say uh, 20 degrees uh, or even higher uh, as i will show in the third webinar it's possible to make lager also at, at higher temperatures and you can do that a, a lot faster than if you are at low temperature but as mentioned this is a uh, webinar number three if uh, it's always a bit slow this system if i look at the <clears throat> the range that we have now on the market uh, it's 14 uh, uh, yeasts um, three of them are lager yeast s23 w3470 s189 they all have a different origin then we have some ale yeasts um, most of you guys use us05 as04 uh, s33 is growing um, the others wbo6 is for uh, with beer 256 and t58 is more for a trappist style blonde style uh, 134 is a typical for saison so this is mainly primary fermentation you have ale range f2 which is uh, especially designed for bottle re fermentation uh, we have LA01 for low alcohol beer and HA18 for barley wine style beers. Uh, we call this the Saf Brew range uh, because it's very different from a normal yeast. So these the Saf Brew products are different. Like LA01 is a is a maltose negative yeast, so it does not ferment maltose. So that's why I decided to keep things clear to call this differently. HA18 is a, a yeast enzyme formulation, so half of the, of the content of the package is, a, is an enzyme, uh, amyloglucosidase. So that's why uh, we, we branded this uh, differently, just for clarity. Then we have so far one bacteria on the market, a Saf Sour LP652 for kettle sour beers. Some functional products like Spring Blanche to create the haze. And fermentation aids, um, spring firm BR2, which is is growing actually quite fast because a lot of brewers uh, add more and more uh, sugar uh, to the to their beer, so uh, to to get lighter beers, uh, and then sometimes uh, you don't extract all the nutrition that you need. You know, besides the sugar, you also need nitrogen, phosphor, sulfur uh, compounds. Um, so for the, the, the beers that are high in sugar content or high in rice content, we have some fermentation aids that provides this, this missing nutrition that you normally get from, uh, from uh, the barley. So if we look at the full range of, uh, of yeast, um, this might be a little bit complex picture for you, but what is shown here is actually, uh, it's called a phylogenetic tree. And it says something about uh, the genetic relatedness between the yeast. So the further distant they are, the more different the yeasts are. And try to uh, uh, make sure uh, that that we, if we bring something new to the market, it's um, it, it's it's diverse from something else. So to give you an idea, SO4, for instance, which you use a lot, is in this clade. And it's quite distant from, I would say, S33, for instance, which is here. So if you look, you just have to measure, actually, the, the, the length of the line. And then you can see, OK, these are very different from, from each other. So if normally, if you have a lot of genetic differences, you can also expect physiological difference, so different flavor profiles. And I, I think most of you have experienced uh, that if you use another yeast, you get different flavor profiles. That's the whole idea. Um, this also shows that if, if, so this is very different from, for instance, liquid yeast, where you have a lot of different ones. Uh, we believe that with a single yeast, you can produce many different beers. So only if 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 there's a you know significant differences uh, genetically and physiologically we will bring a new yeast to the market otherwise just stick to the yeast that you know very well and change the condition of fermentation to get different flavor profiles but i will come to that in the, in a later seminar <clears throat> 
So what all the yeasts have in common is, of course, uh, the alcoholic fermentation. This is just a short summary of what happens. You start with sugar and you convert that to CO2 and ethanol, and it's about 50-50. Uh, so if you start with 180 gram sugars, you make around 92 gram ethanol and 88 gram of CO2. Uh, you also produce heat uh, during fermentation, as most of you know. Um, to, if, if you want to uh, bring it down to actual values, you also make some other things. And one guy uh, called uh, Mr. Balling, uh, he made an equation already, I think, in the 70s or something. But it's quite uh, accurate. So actually, when you start with uh, with one kilo of sugar, you make around 480 grams ethanol, 460 grams CO2, and also, obviously, a little bit of yeast. Uh, so you, uh, when you start your fermentation, you see uh, the amount of yeast increasing. So it's about 5% of all the sugars that you put in uh, are transferred into, into biomass. If we look a little bit more closely uh, uh, to the to the metabolism, obviously everybody starts with malt or sugar, uh, but in this case, let's keep it easy. We start with malt, we do the mashing to get fermentable sugars. In general, the composition of the word is around 10 to 15 percent of uh, of glucose, 50 to 60 percent maltose. 10 to 20% uh, maltotriose, and then 15 to 20% dextrins. This is obviously depending on your malt bill. So if you have a, a very highly modified malt, uh, high, heavy roasted, then you will see that uh, the simple sugar content will go down and you will end up with higher uh, content of, of the others. So this is really depending on, on, the, on, the, on the malt bill. So in general, it's like this, but this can be obviously a bit different. Uh, you ferment these sugars into all kinds of products. Most two most important ones are ethanol and CO2, but always you always make a bit of glycerol. So this brings uh, the mouthfeel to your beer, a, a bit uh, uh, more viscosity. Depending on the yeast, you also make acids, uh, different ones. Um, can be lactic acid, can be acetic acid, can be succinic acid. Those are the main three um, that are produced. It can be a lot, it can be a little bit, it's, it's depending on the yeast. As I mentioned, you also make biomass and obviously also aromas and flavors. But if you compare the amount, so here you are in the amount, if you start with a kilo, you are also in, a, in like half a kilo amount, so quite a lot. And this is all in, in PPMs, in, in parts per million, parts per billion amounts. And so it's only a little bit of flavor, but you only need a little bit to sense it. If it would be too much, you get more lemonade, which is not nice. Um, sometimes you don't want a lot of flavor, so you just select a yeast that doesn't make that much flavors, um, like USO5, for instance. Uh, it's very limited in, in flavors. If you want to have a, a lot of flavors, you select one that makes, uh, makes a lot of flavors. You also end up with residual sugars. This is also very strongly depending on the yeasts. Some yeasts leave a lot of sugars behind, so these are most times the higher sugars, uh, maltotriose, dextrins. Um, some use part of the maltotriose, others don't use maltotriose at all. It's a, it's, it's a fair amount that you still uh, remain in your beer. It brings sweetness. Uh, it also makes sure that you can build up a, a nice foam layer um, in the beer which is in, in, in also in Estonia important, foam. In other countries, I also work in the UK, foam is not very important, they don't really care about the foam. Um, so it's, it's, it's depending also on the country, you know, what, what you want to do in this, in this process. So if we focus more on the flavors, because all the other things, you know, uh, are, are quite common and, um, and most brewers are, are interested in the flavor of the beer, so if we go a little bit more closely and, and look what actually happens, and this is again a simplified version of, of reality. So we start with sugar here and we make, you know, via glycolysis and the ethanol uh, uh, pathway, we make ethanol. So it goes like this. But as you can see, we make a lot of other things. Uh, some flavors are undesired like SO2, 
the rotten egg flavor H2S. Uh, it, it sometimes is produced in, in fermentation. Um, diacetyl uh, is, is very common. Um, it's not a real problem because you can remove it quite easily. Uh, acetaldehyde, green apple flavor, those are most times seen as undesired. Um, this is a bit, the acetaldehyde is a little bit on the edge. It's in the gray zone. Sometimes it's nice, depending on, uh, on the beer style you make. Um, what everybody likes are these guys, uh, the esters. Um, so you have a lot of acetate esters. Uh, the two most important ones are isoamyl acetate and ethyl acetate. So banana and the solventy flavor. And all the yeasts in the world make these two flavors always. It's just uh, the difference is uh, in a lager, these amounts are very low, often uh, uh, under threshold even. So you cannot actually taste it or you have to be a very experienced taster to pick these up in lagers. Um, but it can also be very high, like in Trappist style beers uh, or in triples. Then you have these guys, um, the fatty acid uh, esters also produced uh, by a lot of yeast, but, but less pronounced than these uh, acetate esters. One I want to highlight is the 4-VG, the 4-vinyl guaiacol. It's the phenolic spicy flavor that you get in a Belgian style wheat beer or German style wheat beer um, that you get in uh, saison beers. Um, this compound is actually only produced if there's ferulic acid um, available in in your words and this is made from from or available uh, in the mashing process so if you start uh, uh, from sugar only um, you will never produce this 4vg because it has no ferulic acid so it's a uh, it's it's Bring a little bit sense, you know, in 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 uh, and, and give you an idea. Okay, uh, what type of flavors are produced by what type of yeast? We came up with this. Uh, we call it the baseline. Um, so what we did uh, uh, with all our yeasts is we we brewed a fifteen plate of wort, a very standard uh, two row spring barley, three EBC Weirman. <clears throat> We have a bitterness of 25 IBU, and we did it with iso alpha extract, so no hop addition, just the alpha extract. We pitched all these at 50 gram per hectoliter at a temperature of 23 degrees, and we did all the fermentation uh, in atmospheric pressure. And then we just checked, uh, we did a, an extensive sensory analysis, and we just checked, okay, where are they? And we decided to, to present three axes, so a fruity axis, a spicy axis, and a neutral axis, and then simply position the yeast uh, based on, on what we measured sensory. Obviously, if you change uh, your malt bill, uh, this will move, these will move around. But just to give you, okay, uh, if you want to brew a very fruity beer and you don't know what yeast to start from, you can always check this and say, okay, I want to make a very fruity beer. It should be uh, uh, POF negative, so no phenolic flavors. Then you look on the fruity X and say, okay, S33 is the most fruity banana, fruity beer, uh, a fruity yeast that, that we have in the range. So you can select based on that. Uh, even if you change uh, uh, the, the mashing conditions, it will still, it will always be a fruity one. But uh, if, you, uh, if you change your malt bill, it can be, become a little bit less or a little bit more fruity depending obviously on on your original gravity but and, and on your exact word composition the reason that we cannot do all because you guys you know, are, are very creative and uh, and do things differently all the time so it's impossible because you have so many options you know if you just look only at the malt bill i think there are now around 200 250 different malts available on the market and then you use it often in combination, like three, four different malts for one beer. So it's impossible. The, the amount of combination that you can do to make a beer is virtually unlimited. So for us, it's very hard to, 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 to do all of the, uh, uh, of the options. It's impossible. So that's why I decided to go for a standard, uh, standardized condition. Um, as you can see, there's one a little bit of an outsider. It's S23. Uh, which is a lager yeast, 
and you would expect it to be more neutral. But apparently in this condition at high temperature, it becomes a little bit more fruity. So that's why it's positioned here. These guys are uh, the spicy ones. Uh, so they are all phenolic uh, off flavor positive. It's called POF positive yeast. Um, so these have uh, the, the genes that you need to convert ferulic acid to the 4VG, so to the spicy compound. So let's, let's now, if, if you want to have more information on, on like the baseline on, 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 on all the research that we did, we have a small book, a brochure, uh, we call it the tips and tricks. You can download it here at our website and you, you can have all kinds of information that is relevant for you. Uh, like alcohol tolerance, uh, main ester development in different conditions. So here, for instance, we have different yeast uh, and different uh, odor units. And then you can see, okay, this is a very fruity one. This is not that fruity. We have fermentation kinetics. These are only for the baseline, but uh, it, it gives you at least an idea on how long a fermentation should, should take. So if you, for instance, look at this dotted line, it's a, it's a USO5, which you all use a lot. And it takes maybe, you know, one and a half week or two weeks to ferment. It's a slow yeast. So if you, if you are brewing with this yeast and you're done in three days, uh, something is most likely uh, wrong with your fermentation. On the other hand, if you have uh, S33 or SO4, which are faster yeast, they grow faster. Uh, if you're still fermenting after two or three weeks, something is also wrong. So this at least gives you an idea on, okay, am I doing uh, uh, well in, in fermentation? So you can, it's freely downloadable. Uh, maybe even Allah has some, uh, some, um, some copies uh, in his shop. Uh, at, at different events, we always have a lot of copies uh, of, of, this, uh, of this brochure available. So now let's go to the actual subject of today, uh, the shelf life and the production of and the quality of yeast. So as I mentioned, um, we uh, produce all our yeast in this uh, beautiful facility in Ghent. It's, it's, it's near the canal, so all supply of products is, uh, is, is via the canal. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but obviously we have here a lot of storage tanks for molasses, which is our base ingredient. We have a big uh, water uh, 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 cleaning uh, facility, obviously. Uh, here and here in the big buildings are uh, the big fermenters. I will show you pictures of that later, where we actually produce the yeast. And here, this is the, the, the packaging, uh, so where we package uh, all the yeast. So if we look at it more schematically, um, how does the active dry yeast process actually work? We start uh, from, from the freezer with a small vial with pure culture yeast, and then we propagate to bigger volumes. So we start, say, with, a, with, a, with some milligrams in a test tube, then we go to more a gram level um, in, the, in this Verizon's uh, flask, uh, we continue, this, so this is already uh, a few hundred grams and like five, six liter volume. And then we enter uh, the first propagation fermenter, actually, uh, where we produce a, a few hundred kilos. This is all uh, pure culture, so uh, all with sterile air. And then we enter uh, the big production uh, fermenter, so this is already a few tons say three to three to five tons we produce on this level and this is where we stop for beer uh, for the for the brewing yeasts because that's the level uh, that we need uh, for the production level for the market obviously we have bigger ones uh, for bread production where you make a few hundred tons in uh, in in one batch so if we if we start here we have say three to five tons of yeast we centrifuge this uh, to remove most of the water. Then we store it um, just uh, very shortly uh, between like a few hours and a day because this process is a bit slower. Um, that's the only reason. So after this short storage, uh, what we do is we filter it on a vacuum filter, uh, a rotating drum. I will show a picture of that. 
Then we extrude it, we send it to the drying plant, and we uh, end up with uh, a packed uh, dried yeast. As you can see here, we also make liquid yeast, but liquid yeast is for like the big volumes. As some big bakeries use truckloads per day. Um, the reason that we uh, very strongly believe in dry yeast for brewing is because brewers are everywhere around the world. And uh, as I will show in this presentation, if you have a dry yeast, you can store it in, in a lot of different uh, uh, conditions. Uh, it will still be very viable and, and usable. That's very different for liquid yeast when you have a, a lower survival rate, a lower viable cell count in general. It, it deteriorates very fast over time. So let's look at one of the production fermenter. So this is around uh, 200 cubic meters. Uh, so uh, what is it? Uh, 20,000 hectares or something. It's huge. Um, a big difference with a, with a normal fermenter is that obviously we blow in air because we don't want to produce alcohol. We want to produce biomass. That's, that's our business. So the amount of force that is going in in these systems is, is tremendous. Um, every year, well, now with the, the whole COVID situation, it's, 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 it's a bit different. But before, uh, we always invited uh, every year all, all brewers to come and visit the factory so they can see with their own eyes uh, what we do. Um, obviously, this year is not happening. Maybe next year, uh, we hope we'll see. And then you're most welcome uh, to join. Oh, my, so my, this platform is a bit slow on presentation. So what happens in this, uh, in this big uh, production fermenter? This is shown schematically here. It's a bit of a, of a, of a complex slide uh, because it's, 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 it's more academic. So what you have here is, is what we do is we duplicate the yeast in the fermenter. And every yeast goes through, we call it the cell cycle. And in the cell cycle, you have four phases, G1, S, G2, and M. So G1 is, um, is growth phase one, uh, where actually you start with a cell and you grow the cell to a certain size. And at some point, you, you, you start budding. Uh, you enter the re replication phase or in the cell cycle, it's called synthesis, so where you start synthesizing DNA. Then you enter the G2 phase, uh, and in the G2 phase, what happens is, is uh, uh, you split the DNA, basically, to enter M phase, which is mitosis. And in mitosis, uh, uh, the cell splits, you stop growing, um, and you, you basically end up with two cells. And this goes on and on. And what we do in these big production fermenters, we are able um, to stop this cell cycle in the G1 phase. And the G1 phase is, 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 uh, is optimal for, for both fermentation later on, if you make beer, but also for drying. Because in this phase, you have a lot of trehalose produced. Trehalose is a sugar uh, that you need to protect basically all the, the enzymes that are present in the membrane um, to preserve actually the structure of the, of the enzymes. So you, it's, it's used as kind of a stabilizer. And you, in addition to that, you also have a lot of sterols produced uh, in this phase that are also used to stabilize or to make the, the, the membrane more fluid. Because these enzymes, these are all transporters uh, that you need uh, later on in fermentation uh, to transport your glucose molecule into the cell to convert it into ethanol. So this is, is, a, is, is quite an interesting uh, uh, process. And what is also interesting is that it's different for every yeast. So the basis is the same, but the conditions that we apply to, to stop everything in this phase uh, is different. Um, because what we do is we do fat batch fermentation, which means that we add um, nutrients. So we start with the batch phase like you do normally in fermentation and then we add nutrients and by 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 this addition we are able to bring every uh, yeast cell in the g1 phase which is optimal for 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 drying in the end and fermentation later on 
So if we go back to the process, uh, I just want to show you a picture of the of the of the vacuum filter. So we produce the yeast. Uh, we are already at very high uh, dry matter level, but especially if we remove it in, in centrifugation. But we obviously we want to keep it uh, make it as dry as possible. So the first step in the drying is is the uh, is the rotating drum filtration. Uh, this is a picture of that. So th these are quite big rolling uh, uh, systems where we actually vacuum the whole surface. The surface is is, is, is sprayed with a with a starch layer, and on that layer we uh, we we spray the yeast. And then the yeast is sucked dry, uh, so quite similar to uh, if you would make coffee under vacuum, uh, you 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 are left with uh, with a residue, and in this case the residue is our product, and then we scrape off this this small yeast layer, and then after this we extrude it, so we break it down into into little parts, little particles, and then we dry those little particles. So in 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 short. Uh, we start with a pure culture yeast uh, in, in, the, in the laboratory. We enter fermentation. Uh, we do some, we have short term storage of the cream. We do rotating film uh, uh, filtration and uh, instant drying. So, important to remember is it's a fat batch process on, uh, on a specific media based on molasses. And due to this process, we can stop uh, the process. Uh, at the optimal moment to shape the yeast both for drying but also for fermentation later on and each yeast has its own dedicated process so if we look under the microscope uh, to see what happens is before drying so this is a sample taking uh, at the centrifugation step we see you know the yeast is nice uh, conical cylindrical uh, shaped uh, this this guy is budding actually you see a butt scar here so it, it's very smooth the surface uh, then we dry it and as you can see the surface is wrinkling so we e extract not only the water that is surrounding the yeast but also uh, we extract uh, the water that is inside the yeast and because of the this this specific fat batch process uh, the yeast doesn't burst if you would not apply uh, the right conditions the cell would simply burst open and and die so we are able to preserve the cell structure in this case we are at around 95 percent dry matter level um, which is uh, which is uh, ideal actually to preserve it over a long time what you see as a brewer uh, uh, is are these small granules so I think most of you have been using uh, dry yeast if you open a pack you see like this these small granules uh, which are you know little kernels of of, uh, of, of yeast that that sticks together uh, there are millions of, of yeast in, in, a, in a kernel and we vacuum pack uh, to preserve it and we have a certain shelf life but I will come to that later so quality, and because a lot of people uh, wonder about the quality, uh, is, 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 is shown a little bit in this flow chart. Um, so what we do actually to ensure that, because we make different yeast, to ensure that the yeast that is inside the pack that you buy is, is the yeast with the properties that you want. So we start actually in our research center. Uh, if we start with a new strain, um, it enters the yeast collection. So in total, uh, our collection is now around 8,000 different yeasts. Um, we only have uh, uh, 14 on the market, so but we still have a lot of, 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 of potential in, in our vault, in our, uh, re in our freezer. So what we do is uh, when we have this collection, uh, we start and we check genetically purity and properties. So genetically, uh, we do, uh, uh, it's called inter-delta analysis uh, to ensure that the yeast that we have is actually the yeast that we have. We look at this on a, on, on a genetic level. Then we check uh, purity. Purity, what is, what is purity? We look for uh, if it's contaminated with possible with bacteria, uh, uh, like pediococcus or, or a lactococcus or wild yeast even. Uh, so this is checked in every step. 
So if you go from the R&D collection and you enter the factory, and we call that the industrial collection, everything is checked. Um, from that, we select, of course, uh, the, the test tube uh, where we start the whole process with. And again, we check genetic purity and properties. And then in the end, this the, when we enter the factory, we check uh, genetics and properties and purity again. So when we start the process, we are very, uh, I would say, 100% sure that we start uh, with the yeast that we want to produce and nothing else. Then in the factory, uh, where we, we start, we call it the daughter line, uh, because if you start from, from uh, the main line, every time you take a, a sample from the main line, we call it the daughter line. We start with the laboratory phase. Uh, there we only check for purity and control because we already did for genetic checks uh, in the in the previous phase, so it's not required anymore. Uh, it's just the purity control that is, is relevant. And then we enter the industrial phase, we produce biomass and we store it uh, before analysis. Uh, in the analysis phase, we check a lot of things. Right? So this is the phase before we enter the market. Again, purity, composition, also aging aspects uh, and, and properties. I will talk in detail about the aging uh, later on uh, purity i just mentioned so we we check uh, for for uh, for lact uh, lactic acid bacteria we use uh, mrs procedure for that uh, we check for wild yeast uh, possibility contamination we, we use the lysine method for that so we are quite sure uh, that we have uh, we reach a very high purity uh, in the end uh, that you as a customer uh, can buy in the shop um, so let's look at this uh, uh, quality in, in of the final yeast so i split it up in ale and, and lager yeast so the ale yeast our current uh, specifications are as follows uh, the viable yeast count is uh, one to ten to the tenth viable cells per gram of yeast so if you pitch at 50 gram per hectoliter you end up with uh, with a, a five times 10 to the six uh, uh yeast cells per milliliter so this is a lot the 10 billion cells per uh, per, per gram purity uh, uh for lacto uh, uh lactose we find less than one colony forming unit per 10 to the 70 yeast cells which is actually uh at or below detection level uh acetic acid pediococcus similar and total bacteria it's less than five uh, times 10 to the seventh uh, so uh, if you bring that down to a, to a more understandable number it's less than one uh, bacteria for 10 million viable yeast cells which brings the purity up to 99.999 percent and you might wonder so why don't you have 100 percent purity uh, the reason for that is in our last production fermenter, uh, we cannot apply sterile filtration for the air. So we apply a, a deep filtration. Uh, so there's still a possibility that something that is floating in the air uh, enters. So that's why I, our purity is 99.999%. It's still the best purity that is available on the market today worldwide for active dry yeast. Let's continue. Uh, lager yeast, uh, very similar. The viable cell count is a little bit lower. Um, you will see later on why that is. Um, lager yeasts are a bit, little bit harder to produce. They are more sensitive than, than ale yeast. Um, I think in this uh, third or fourth webinar, I will come to a little bit more detail why that is, because uh, uh, lager yeasts are hybrid yeast, so they have a different and a little bit more sensitive. If you look at purity, uh, again, the values are very similar to, uh, to ale yeast. Um, again, the purity is 99.999% uh, at packaging. Uh, if you look at uh, the contamination, it's one LAB for 6 million viable yeast cells. So if you start your fermentation, you start with so many yeast cells that, you know, if there's even if there's one bacteria, it doesn't really matter because it will never win the competition because there are too many others, too many yeast cells uh, 
uh, available that will use all the available sugar. Um, so it's not affecting actually the fermentation. And we know that because we have been on the market for many, many years and, and hundreds and thousands of breweries are using uh, our yeast. So uh, we are quite confident in that. So if you have an issue uh, in fermentation and you think, okay, the yeast is, uh, it's probably the yeast, it might be contaminated uh, or whatever. We, we always are, are uh, taking care of, uh, of any complaints very carefully. We look at it, but the chance that you have a contam contaminated yeast in the pack is extremely low because we have such a, a, a good quality system. We will, if, if we find something that is not according to this specification, it will not be packed. It will not be put on the market. So a lot of brewers ask, so what's the difference, you know, between liquid yeast and, and active dry yeast? Because some people say they swear it, ah, oh, liquid yeast is always fresher, it's always better. So what we did is we simply looked at the... So we just started from, from the liquid and from the dried yeast. And the liquid yeast is in this case called brewery yeast. Um, if you look at uh, um, the gravity over time, you see it's very similar. They end up at the same, the profile is, is, is very similar. So there's not much difference uh, if you dry it or, or if you start from a dry yeast or if you start from a liquid yeast. Uh, word attenuation, uh, very similar again. So they end up at, at the same level um, uh, and even the profile is again the same. Very relevant for a lot of brewers. What about the aromatic profile? So this is shown in numbers. It's, it's, uh, it's not ideal, but anyway, if you look at the liquid yeast, which you know is a, this was done actually by BRI, which is a, an independent uh, um, uh, research institute in the UK. Uh, by uh, and it was done by an expert sensory panel so 35 expert tasters evaluated uh, these parameters for both the liquid yeast and the active dry yeast and as you can see for the liquid yeast for instance in, in estuary profile so fruity it's between 3.8 and 5 if we look at the dry yeast it's 4.95 4.98 so it's, it's all in the same range if you compare the numbers so there's not really a difference between liquid yeast or dry yeast if you look at the final beer profile so in short the kinetics are the same flocculase characteristics are the same and the aroma profile are the same so in addition which is uh, i will show you that of course uh, dry yeast has a very long shelf life um, you don't need to oxygenate the wort prior to pitching if you use dry yeast. Um, it has a higher cell count uh, normally in a package if you compare to liquid yeast. Um, and it's usually more affordable than liquid yeast. However, as you all know, there are many, many different liquid yeast strains available. So there's more, uh, more choices. And as I mentioned at the start of the webinar, these choices um, uh, we believe uh, you don't need that much, uh, you don't need hundreds of yeast to produce all the different beer styles. With a single yeast, you can produce different beer styles. So that's why we have only a limited uh, um, range of, of, of products in the portfolio, and we only add new yeast if it really brings value to the current portfolio. So I'll just go over this quickly, uh, you know, I, I will not actually, you can read it later on, but it's basically uh, um, summarizing, uh, you know, the, the, the benefits of, uh, of dry yeast. So how long can you store the yeast? So what we did is uh, we did, uh, we started from fresh yeast, you know, that was just packed. We checked viability, fermentation performance, um, and at the end of fermentation, we looked at uh, the aromatic profile, ethanol production, you know, all the general things. Um, 
we looked at, uh, uh, at different temperatures and times. The temperature I will show later. So we do a force aging test. And a force aging test is basically a test where you bring up the temperature, bring down the temperature, you do kind of a cycling of the temperature to, to, to mimic uh, natural aging of yeast. So this is just a fast way of testing natural aging. I will also show results later on the natural aging part, but the first one is, is all force aging test. So we compress, uh, we compare the fresh versus um, the aged yeast. So this is a yeast that is at best before date or even past uh, best before date. So if we start with SO4, which you all use a, a lot, so I will not show all the yeast, but uh, uh, I will focus on, on some of them. Um, if we start uh, at year zero, obviously we have 100% viability. And then if we look at the equi equivalent years of natural aging, so this is force age, I don't know, in 45 days or something, we see the viability goes down a little bit. Um, but still after four years, you are well above 90% for ill yeasts. If you look at the kinetics, so this is fresh yeast time versus ethanol production. So this is a, a typical fermentation profile. Um, we did it again at, at standard conditions, uh, starting from 50 gram per hectoliter pitching in, in Weimar Pilsen malt 15 Plato, and this, these were done at 20 degrees. This is a summary of five batches. If we look at uh, the aged, it looks very similar. I will put them together now. Uh, and then you see uh, the, the kinetics uh, are, are, are very similar between fresh and aged and this is aged for four years lager uh, and the, here i i uh, present age differences especially you see the the, the confidence intervals uh, deviate you see that the age yeast is 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 the profile is the same but it it has a longer time to start up so the it's, it has a longer lag time. Um, it ended uh, in the same conditions, but you see it's a little bit different. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more sensitive, I would say, if you compare fresh versus, uh, versus aged. So now for all yeasts, uh, all together, uh, and this is if you compare fresh between uh, force aged for USO5, SO4, WBO6, etc bottom line is uh, if you compare all these they're all the same and sometimes you see a little bit of difference but it's all within um, uh, the normal error margin so statistically there's no difference uh, between uh, the fresh and the aged yeast in this case in fermentation time and and productivity so how much ethanol you produce per day it's all very very comparable uh, ester development, so this is uh, the final samples, yeah, as I mentioned. It, again, it's the same. You see, sometimes uh, it's the, the, the error is a bit bigger, but statistically, there's no difference between this bar and this bar. So for all the yeasts, it's, it's very comparable. The age versus the fresh uh, yeast. So also for ester development for higher alcohol, so this is actually the flavor of, of the beer. Then if you look at uh, the lager, um, you see, uh, again, fresh versus aged. Not a lot of difference in, in, in uh, the final ethanol content. Uh, not a lot of difference, or at least not statistically different uh, in ester development. Uh, productivity, we see a little bit of difference. So uh, it's a bit logical because we, we saw that, that uh, you know, in, in, in a, a few slides back that it was slower. Uh, if you age it, the lager becomes a bit slower. And that's what you see here. The, the, the ethanol production per day is simply uh, slower. It reaches the same level in the end, but it takes longer. So here we see some deviation. Um, uh, but for flavor, this is, these are higher alcohol contents. It's very similar again. So uh, for the forced aging, main conclusions, uh, 
it's quite robust for the ALS over four years of time. Uh, a similar fermentation performance, similar characteristics, similar flavor profile. Um, we say the best before it is three years, but it's mainly based on, on uh, uh, the lagers because for the lagers we see, okay, after year four, we see some deviations, for instance, in productivity. So we say, okay, the best before date uh, is set to three years. And to make it more clear for everyone, uh, also the ales we put at three years. Uh, so, you know, if you use fermented yeast within three years, it's always fine. That said, if you look at the results I just shown, uh, if you still have a yeast pack laying around, <laughs> which is uh, four years, you can still use it. There's no problem uh, of using it in your brewery, as you, as you saw. Um, for the lagers, it's... Uh, it's still possible, um, but if you want to reach the same like fermentation speed, you should pitch a bit more. So these three years is 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 that we guarantee you will uh, you will find the same results as as fresh. Um, if you go beyond that date, uh, for lagers it, it deviates a little bit. So the ales are very robust, the lagers are a bit more sensitive uh, to aging. So storage temperature. Uh, that's a question we get also quite often. Uh, what's the impact of storage temperature on the, on the yeast vitality? So these are results from natural aging tests. Again, we start with fresh yeast, where we uh, test the viability, the fermentation performance, and we also do tasting, so sensory analysis. Uh, this is an ongoing process. So the, 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 the results I'm showing now are results from three years and eight months of natural aging at minus 20, at 5 degrees, and at 25 degrees. And then for the aged, uh, we, uh, of course, check viability, fermentation performance, and sensory, uh, again, to be able to compare it to the fresh part. So first, as a four again, top fermentation. Uh, year zero is, of course, the fresh yeast. It's 100% viability. Um, and then we look, if we, if we store it, uh, at, at minus 20 degrees for three years and eight months, what happens to, uh, to, the, to the viability? Well, for SO4, it's still very high. This is around 98%. If you store it at five degrees, it's still very high. It's around 94%. If you store it at 25, you see it's very high uh, still. So even at uh, above room temperature, it's, the viability uh, stays up to the high level. If you look at uh, kinetics, and in this case, uh, I'm showing extract uh, versus time, so the, uh, the, 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 the the decreasing extract over time. Uh, for SO4, so fresh is, is yellow, green is at 5, uh, blue is at minus 20, and red is at 25. You see, you know, the fresh is, is going a little bit faster, or it looks like it's going a little bit faster, but actually it's, this, this is very similar. Uh, uh, curves for, for all of them. As the profile, um, uh, I'm showing here a spider plot, uh, which basically marks the main characteristics or parameters that we identified in the sensory panel, so fruitiness, spiciness, vegetal, flora, etc. Those are ranked on a scale from 0 to 8. Uh, by uh, uh, an expert panel. So uh, these are many tasters that taste independently. And then you get a score like this. So if you look, for instance, at the fruitiness, you see in this case, the fresh one seems to be a little bit more fruity. Uh, spiciness, uh, it seems to be uh, that, that it's very similar if you store at five or at fresh. There are no really differences. Floral, it's all the same. And these this is very close together eh? so uh, and this this is done by an expert panel so most i would say uh, normal uh, beer users beer drinkers do not even pick up these differences that's uh, it's it's uh, it's all the same uh, it's very comparable but in this you know expert panel we see some differences uh, but not much it's a uh, it's uh, i would say uh, neglectable almost Uh, for lagers now, uh, where we again look at viability uh, um, at year zero is 100%, and then 
we look at storage at minus 20 for three years and eight months at five and 25 all three years and eight months and we see if you store the lager at minus 20 the viability uh, goes down quite significantly from 100 to 80 percent if you store it in the in the refrigerator so at around five degrees we keep the high viability uh, at 95 percent if you store it at a higher temperature 25 we also see it going down we are at around 60 percent so this indicates uh, again that the lager yeast is is more sensitive and it's best stored uh, not too low temperature and not too high temperature so put it in your refrigerator that also is visualized uh, by the kinetics so again extract uh, decrease over time uh, as you can see the fresh yeast which is, is is the orange is the fastest then if you store it at five degrees uh, it, it ends up at the same uh, uh, same gravity but it's a little it starts up a little bit slower uh, uh, similar minus 20. and then at 25 you see you know because you start with a very low uh, or a, 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 like twice as low uh, viability it, it even takes longer in the end, they end up uh, all at very similar final gravities. And again, these were done in, in, in all the same conditions, obviously. Look at the, the sensory, the flavor profile. Uh, again, the same parameters uh, that, uh, that we uh, used in the, in the sensory tasting. Um, um, fruitiness, spiciness, uh, etc. All these descriptors stored at 525 and fresh um, it's very similar you see they are very close together which is also kind of logical because a lager is more neutral in the first place um, if you look at, at at fruitiness for instance you see if it's stored at higher temperature we finally um, uh, uh, pick up a little bit more fruitiness uh, which is actually in line with uh, with the metabolism uh, which which is something that you would expect um uh fresh is is come second and then stored at five degrees but these differences so this is all between four and and five so it's very you know uh, this this can be picked up by an expert panel but not by uh by most people uh these differences are are, are very very small so as you can see you know for all the descriptors the, the sensory characteristics are are quite similar um for the different storage conditions so in conclusion and this, this is just summing up everything i i discussed uh our purity is is very high uh we are to, to my knowledge the best on the market with 99.999 purity uh, so very high quality yeast i showed you that there's no significant difference between fresh and forced aged yeast for uh uh, mainly for the ales, um, for the lagers, we saw a little bit uh, of uh, of difference uh, after four years. That's why our shelf life has been put to three years uh, for all the yeasts. But as you saw, ales, you know, are doing way better. So if you have a pack that is a bit older, you can still use it. Storage conditions uh, overall, if we look, uh, best place is in cool conditions. So put it in your refrigerator. Don't freeze it uh, because for the lagers, uh, it has quite a big impact. For the eels, it has a limited impact. But just you know, to keep things simple, if you put it in the refrigerator, it's, uh, it's the best. Um, if you look at aromatic profile um, in all the different conditions, it's, it's very similar. It's not really affected uh, for, for all the yeasts. Um, if you look at, and this, this is a question I get, uh, can we reuse the pack that has been opened? Uh, no, you cannot. Uh, you can store it maybe, you know, if you re-vacuum it and store it for a very short time, uh, it could be possible, but not much longer than a day or maybe two days. It's, uh, it should be used directly and the reason is uh, if you leave the the yeast in the refrigerator the refrigerator is very uh, humid normally you have around 100 percent humidity in in the refrigerator and this is a, a an extremely dry product so it's very high hygroscopic it attracts the water immediately um, 
So even if you vacuum, uh, you know, normally you don't have the, uh, the aluminium uh, double layered foil that we use in our packaging. You have a plastic bag that you use to, to re-vacuum and that leaves water through. It leaves, uh, uh, it leaves air through. So in the end, uh, you, will, you will already hydrate your yeast in the refrigerator. So if you want to have the best results, you, you cannot uh, uh, use an open pack. Uh, last but not least, uh, direct pitch is not impacted by aging. And this is something I will show next week in next week's uh, webinar, where I will discuss uh, the differences between um, uh, rehydration of the yeast before pitching or the direct pitch. Ah, uh, we got this. Uh, who asks if... Um, a closed packet can be stored in the refrigerator. Yes, you have to store uh, always your yeast in the refrigerator in a closed pack. The foil that we use to pack is uh, is watertight. So it's a multi-layer foil. Uh, it has uh, uh, aluminum and also plastic layers. Uh, uh, so it's it's uh, it, it, water cannot penetrate in, in the pack. So I want to finalize uh, by just indicating um, that we have a Fermentus app. You can download it uh, for Android and, and for the iPhone in the, in the Apple Store. In this app, we have a lot of information um, uh, that you can access, which is sometimes not available online um, or in the tips and tricks. So if we have new information, if we have an update, we will put it in the app first. Um, in the app, it's obviously digital, so you can click on things uh, and, and get additional information. Um, for instance, uh, I will not show that here, but in, in lay, if you, for instance, click on, uh, if you if you go uh, uh, to, to this, make your choice, so uh, you click, you, you enter the, the app, you click on make your choice, you see this, you can actually click on the yeast to get characteristics. And if there's experimental data available, you will also get those experimental results. And for instance, for W3470, as I will show in a later webinar, we did it at different gravities, different temperatures, different pitching rates. Um, you will see uh, those experimental results. Uh, so you can use that uh, for your own uh, benefit. Uh, we have another question coming in. Are clump balls of yeast in package formed by humidity in fridge? Are these yeast balls problematic quality fermentation when direct pitching if problematic how to avoid these yeast clump balls uh, normally um, uh, you should not have a lot of these uh, clumps uh, in the pack if you have a clump if you pitch it uh, directly in your fermenter in the end it will break open uh, because you have uh, many days of, of fermentation it will be hydrated so the the, the outer layer will break off and uh, you will end up with just a, a nicely suspended yeast. So it's not a, it's not a problem. Uh, if you have an open packed and you have these yeast clumps, it is a problem uh, because the, then these clumps are, are formed by uh, rehydration of the yeast. So actually there's, the yeast has access to water. If the yeast has access to water, it wants to start growing. But there's no substrate available because in the refrigerator is this just water. So what happens is uh, is uh, the, the the yeast cell will will die inevitably. I have a lot of questions now coming in. Um, sh shall I first just finalize, guys, and then I will answer uh, the questions. So this was on the app. Um, next uh, uh, webinar will be next week uh, on thursday again at uh, 10 hours your time i will talk about rehydrates first and direct pitching and then do the other program very important if you have ideas or questions if you have comments about this seminar if you want things differently please let me know uh, uh, by completing this like two minute questionnaire uh, if, if you didn't like things if you like things uh, uh, you can just scan this with your phone uh, if you're on a computer i will put the link uh, in the chat uh, 
it's now in the chat. Um, it will go, it will bring you to a, a forum and you can just answer the questions. Also, if you have, you know, specific ideas on, okay, can I, um, uh, I want to have more information on this or on that. If you have a very individual question, you know, which is really strictly related to your brewery, it's best to contact me by email. So I hope you liked it. I'm now going to enter the questions. So I have the first question I didn't answer is uh, from Anton. Could you please, uh, wait, could you, uh, could you please give uh, a bit of tips how to open and dump the packet of dry yeast to the fermenter? What's the most safe practice? Most safe practice is uh, to spray with some alcohol, um, your knife uh, and scissors, but also the pack. You cut it open, and uh, if you pitch directly, um, uh, pitch in only one third of the volume, just throw it in, uh, but make sure that the pack uh, has been uh, has been sanitized. So normally, if you if you spray on alcohol, if you dr let it dry in a little bit, you know, for for a few minutes, when it's all evaporated, it's it's sterile. And also make sure that your hands uh, and 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 your tool. So if you use scissors or if you use a knife, make sure that's also sterile. And then you just cut it and and throw it in. Does that answer your question, Anton? Okay, I'll go to the next one then from uh, from Timion. Uh, he has a few questions. If there's no need to oxygenate the word before pitching dry yeast, should there still be oxygenation later? Uh, and should you oxygenate word if you're topping up from the fermenter? Oxygenation, there's, there's a lot of debate on it. Um, um, if you simply look at... Uh, uh, fermentation wise when you start from active dry yeast all um, the components that you need are in the pack so that's why you don't need to oxygenate the only reason that you oxygenate wort normally is to produce unfaturated fatty, fatty acids that are needed uh, in the in the buildup of the sterile molecule with the fluidity in the in the in the yeast membrane the, these sterols are only produced when there's oxygen available but in a dry pack of yeast, there's plenty of sterols already. On the other hand, what we see, for instance, in the wine business, that if you oxygenate the word, sometimes, not always, sometimes uh, uh, your final gravity can be a little bit lower, like say 0 0.2, 0 0.3, sometimes 0.5 Plato. That's what we see in the wine uh, fermentation. Obviously, that's a different, you know, background. It's must. Um, um, for brewing, it's not needed. If you prefer oxygenation anyway, always do it at the start. So if you are already uh, fermenting for two days, do not oxygenate the wort. If you are topping up uh, a fermentation, do not oxygenate again. Because what you do is... When you oxygenate the wort at the start, uh, you bring actually the yeast in, in uh, you know, in, in, in fantastic conditions. The yeast loves oxygen. Uh, if you can measure oxygen content um, in, in your wort, so if you oxygenate pitch yeast, you will see the oxygen concentration going down very rapidly because the yeast simply uses this oxygen to generate a lot of energy. Uh, and, and if you are in, in fermentation phase, you generate two uh, energy molecules per mole of, of, of glucose. If you are in, uh, in, 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 in conditions where there's oxygen, you generate 28 of these, on average, 28 of these energy molecules. So the yeast can grow a lot faster. But there is a point where there's no oxygen anymore. And then the yeast enters the fermentation mode. So it starts fermenting. Uh, and only in fermentation mode, you produce uh, alcohol. It's a bit more complex because you have different, you, you have also the Crabtree effect. I will explain that in, in later webinars. But in general, in fermentation mode, you produce ethanol. So 
if you are uh, if you oxygenate the word you pitch the yeast okay it, it will uh, it will have to go from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism um, many yeasts don't have any problem with that but if you are already in the fermentative metabolism don't bring it back to aerobic conditions because what happens then is it has to switch again and build all the molecules that you need for uh, for aerobic metabolism it it will it's it's quite bad for your yeast so if you top up the only thing that you do is you dilute but you keep the yeast in the same anaerobic condition which is better because then you don't have to build you know the whole battery of enzymes and proteins that you need for for the for the metabolism of the yeast in, in aerobic conditions i hope that answers the first question the second question, uh, if pitching is directly into Word, temperature, I will, uh, I will uh, answer this question. So this is really about next week's topic, uh, uh, the difference between direct pitching and rehydration. Um, I, will, I will discuss that later on. Um, on ill uh, or lager yeast pitching, rehydration uh, for W3470, I will also discuss that. Uh, I'm not sure if I discuss it. I will answer this. So the question is, uh, for for lager, for in this case W3470, uh, the, the our spec sheet uh, recommends rehydrating at 20 to 25 uh, degrees. However, I see in frequent literature uh, the important uh, to stress the importance of avoiding downward temperature shock for lager yeast. So how I go from a warm uh, rehydration to a cold below 10 degrees pitching temperature. Um, you can just do that, actually. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the cold shock is, uh, is, is, it has some impact, but very limited. The reason uh, the rehydration is done at 20 to 25 degrees, and that's why we recommend it, is it's more practical. So you are at room temperature, you, you don't otherwise, you have to do it in, in cold conditions. Um, you can do that, but it's, it's not required. That's why uh, we are uh, advising this to do that at room temperature. Pitching below 10 degrees. Um, I don't know much brewers actually that do that, uh, even for lager. Normally they are at around 12 to 14 degrees uh, at pitch. Um, it's possible uh, th there's no problem uh, in kinetics we have data in the tips and tricks uh, that has been pitched uh, by heart at 14 and then uh, is at 12 so uh, it's possible um, as i will show in in webinar three you can also make a lager at higher temperature so that might solve your your problem uh, overall uh, it has many benefits does that answer your question, Dimion? Okay, I think so. Okay, then the next question from Thomas. Do you think rousing the tank with oxygen after direct pitch can be good practice for ensuring good mixing in words. Some tanks have a very small opening on top and yeast is very concentrated in specific area rather than spread out over the surface. Um, if possible, the best practice if you do the direct pitch is just fill your fermenter uh, uh, only uh, uh, in the bottom part, so only the conical part. Let's say uh, maybe uh, one third of the volume just to ensure that the whole surface is covered then you pitch the yeast and then you fill up the tank further on that ensures good mixing in of the yeast um, if you fill up the tank completely and pitch the yeast on top uh, and what you do like if you rehydrate uh, but in rehydration you can easily a big tank like uh, like uh, like uh, like you have normally you cannot do that so what ha it's still possible but what happens is if if it's a high dosing uh you will have like a a, a little uh, 
a, a, a little mountain of, of, of yeast sitting on the surface. It will settle, it will, it will go in, but it takes longer. So if you, if you do it, uh, if you pitch it in and then uh, fill up your tank further on, it will mix in automatically. And you will see you will start up your fermentation a lot faster. So if you have that possibility, um, uh, I would definitely re recommend that. Um, if your yeast uh, in, in your uh, system is very concentrated in specific areas, then spread out over, over the surface, um, normally it's not a huge problem because as soon as the yeast starts fermenting, it makes CO2. So if you have a CO2 bubble escaping from a yeast cell, what happens is so you know it farts out uh, the CO2. The the um, the gravity locally in the tank goes down tremendously because the bubble of CO2 will rise to the surface, and then to fill up that gap of the the escaping CO2, it will be filled with uh, with wort, which is uh, it contains your your yeast obviously. So that's how you mix it. Actually, it's it's static mixing, but it's quite it it works quite well because you have a lot of CO2 escaping uh, from your tank. As you see, it's bubbling normally quite uh, quite vigorously, especially at the start, and that's a, a very good signal that you have very good mixing uh, in the tank. Does that that answer your question, Thomas? Okay, thanks. Then one question from Anne. Can I reduce the pitching rate in case of aerating the word? Uh, as you will see, not in next week, but in the week after webinar, pitching rate has, has an impact on, uh, on the flavor profile of beer. Um, you can reduce the pitching rate, obviously. So uh, the pitching rate that we, we give as a recommendation on, on the specification sheet um, is a pitching rate that will always work. But if you prefer to under pitch or to over pitch, you can do that. Um, if you aerate the words, so if you want to have uh, you know some yeast growth at first, uh, obviously uh, you can reduce a little bit the pitch, pitching rate if you go for yeast growth, but you have to realize that you have to be able to count how much yeast is in there. Because normally, uh, not a lot of brewers uh, do a lot of cell counting. They just, you know, aerate the word, toss in the yeast, and then, uh, and then let, it, uh, let it grow. So you don't know exactly how many yeast cells you have at the start. So if you produce a beer, you know, which is, uh, might be the perfect beer for you, uh, you send it in for an award and you win some prizes, uh, then you want to redo it because it was very successful. You don't know exactly the starting conditions. So if you are able to do cell counting, go for it. Uh, if you prefer lower pitching rates, because sometimes a lower pitch uh, can create a, the exact flavor profile that you want. So our pitching rate is just a recommendation. Don't forget if you if it's you that are the creators that are the brewers so if you want to do things differently and i will you know show in detail in in the in the third webinar uh both for ale and lager what happens if you change the pitching rate and how you can use the pitching rate to solve problems for instance or get lower gravities so you just have to join uh, thomas in uh, in a few weeks So, okay, Velo is asking a question. How to reduce yeasty flavor in fermented beer without cold crashing? Even longer fermentation time. Because normally if you do bottle conditioning, um, you don't have any issues with the uh, yeasty flavor. Can you, uh, Velo, can you please... Um, uh, identify or mention what exact flavor that you mean. You mean like the yeast bite or 
waiting for his answer. Um, because normally, you know, a yeast bite uh, is caused by, by dead cells, by dead yeast. Um, uh, it, it releases, you know, this, this typical yeasty flavor. So if you, uh, that's, that's uh, my perception of, of yeasty flavor is like, uh, I don't know if you know the product Marmite, which is like uh, some kind of yeast paste. Um, that's, that's, you know, people in Australia, for instance, eat a lot. It's just the yeast extract actually. And it has this very distinct flavor. Um, it's, it's very unpleasant in beer actually um, uh, normally uh, you don't get that in beer only if you have uh, a lot of uh, uh, yeast cells dying which means there's something uh, in in your conditions that is not going uh, as it should because normally the yeast doesn't die in the, at the end of fermentation. It just enters, you know, a phase of I have to wait for new food. So if you have really dying yeast, I don't know if you if you are um, uh, centrifuging, maybe at a different uh, on a wrong rate. Are you removing the yeast prior to bottle refermentation? How much yeast do you take out when you crash? Uh, uh, you know, if you crash the yeast, if you, uh, uh, in this case, you don't cold crash. So if you don't cold crash, you keep all the yeast in the tank. Which if you, if you put that in the bottle of beer, you will have a massive uh, layer of yeast uh, in your beer. So I don't know exactly how your beer looks then because you will have maybe if you take a 33 centiliter bottle you you might have like a half a centimeter of yeast layer on on the bottom um, obviously at the end of fermentation some yeast should be removed um, uh, i mean even without cold crash you have to sediment at least part of the yeast uh, to remove it uh, from from the beer because otherwise you end up with too much yeast in the beer Um, does that answer your question, fellow? H how much yeast is in your bottle in the end? Is it a lot? Ah, yeah, quite a lot. Yeah, so if you don't want to do the cold crash, my advice would be just wait. So if you normally wait for, say, one or two days, just wait five, six days. It will sediment in the end and then take out um, at least the bottom part of the cone if you have cylinder conical tanks so take at least you know uh, take most of it out after five days just you know uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, quite sludgy and then wait again for another day and check again if there's more yeast coming because some of it will be attached to the side of your tank uh, because it likes, uh, you know, yeast likes surfaces, uh, so it, it it might stick a little bit to to the surface. So make sure that everything uh, has settled, and uh, or most of it has settled, and then you will see you will you will not have a yeast bite anymore in in your beer. Then, uh, last maybe the last question, I don't know. Will any future webinars look at repitching cropped yeast? Uh, and should I treat yeast that was cropped from a fermentation, which was originally pitched uh, dry, uh, any differently to liquid yeast that's been cropped? Um, okay, and should I use less, no yeast nutrients for dry pitching? Um, so I'll answer the last question first. If you pitch dry, uh, it's depending on obviously your, your, your malt bill, uh, your mash. If you have a lot of sugar or a lot of rice added, uh, or, or uh, you know, if you don't use a lot of barley, then you might lack nutrients and you have to add, uh, like spring firm uh, BR2, for instance. Um, if you are in normal brewing,
you don't need any nutrients it's all in the in the barley in the malt so normally it's it's you don't need it uh repitching um uh, i'm i will not focus uh, on uh, we do have information on it uh also on uh, topping up yeast so i might do that in in one of the later uh, webinars um uh, we are not against uh, uh, repitching and not uh, and, and cropping. Uh, we advise not to do it more than like say five times, uh, five to seven times to ensure uh, the quality of the beer that you are producing. Because in some conditions, uh, our purity is 99.999%. But if you uh, crop and repitch a long time, uh, and if you are in certain conditions, you might, uh, uh, you know, increase, uh, you know, conditions that are favorable for the contaminated, uh, contaminations. So normally it's a problem. I never heard anybody actually that is uh, re cropping and repitching that has this problem. Um, but they never went over 10 times, at least the customers in, in my zone. So 10 uh, seems safe. That's why we say five to be really safe. Um, I talked to one brewer in the past who was who, who never bought the yeast. He had been brewing uh, or his brewery had been uh, cropping and repitching over a hundred years with the same yeast. Uh, I'm quite sure this yeast has evolved over time because it's simple evolution. Eh? Uh, so things might change over time. So uh, you can do it. Uh, um, it will not have uh, uh, an impact on the flavor profile um, as long as you don't do it too long because uh, we can never uh, uh, you know um, be sure that your yeast I, I might bring that up in a, in a later webinar is but normally like, you, you, for instance, you are, you are brewing and you add something like uh, some pepper or some other crazy, some fruit, uh, so, some crazy compounds because you brewers do everything. That might be a trigger for for uh, for evolution because if the yeast doesn't like it, and it still wants to grow, it wants to survive, of course. So it will, you know, it will change its metabolism to ensure it can survive in that condition. So it's 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 uh, to sum up. If you like it, uh, repitching, cr crop and repitch, go ahead. Um, make sure to to drink the beer, you know, frequently. And if you don't pick up uh, any problems over time, you can do it. Um, don't do it too long. So don't uh, repitch, you know, more than five, six, seven times to ensure uh, your your ar aromatic profile uh, because if you have been uh, re cropping and repitching I, I would say maybe 10 15 times and there's a problem and you call me i cannot help you anymore because i don't know what's inside your fermenter it can be something completely different you know if i don't know what you added uh, so but in in a limited uh, range it's it's a uh, it's it's no problem uh Okay, I might have misunderstood, but I'm getting the impression here that using active dry yeast is essentially reducing the lack growth phase and moving to anaerobic conditions as fast as possible. Uh, it's depending. Eh? Um, so if you don't aerate the word, so if uh, uh, normally, you know, you, you, uh, you, you have boiled the word, there's no oxygen in there, there's no gas at all. You transfer it to the tank there might be a little bit of oxygen in your tank um, if you don't uh, uh, pre-rinse with co2 which a lot of brewers already do but if you don't there's a little bit of oxygen in the tank it's virtually nothing um, then you you have the yeast in a pack uh, the yeast in the pack is in anaerobic conditions there's nothing there there's it's vacuum so what you do is the yeast is already in this condition you pitch it in an anaerobic condition so the yeast will start growing of course it wants to live and what happens is because there's no oxygen it will immediately uh, build the whole anaerobic uh, 
cluster of enzymes uh, needed to be in anaerobic metabolism. Which is an advantage because you're not wasting energy on building any aerobic compounds that you need for anaerobic uh, for aerobic metabolism. So lag phase is uh, is uh, is complex. It's it's uh, it's not only related to oxygen. It's also related to uh, sugar, uh, the sensitivity to sugars. Um, uh, a lot of organisms have a uh, a sort of it's called a biological clock it has a lot of sensors so i know wh when i was still working at university uh, where we did a lot of research on the lag phase uh, is that a yeast can sense how much and what sugars are in in the world uh, it will always start with the simple ones first but once they have finished so normally, if, if you start up a fermentation with glucose, there's no issue. It will go fast and uh, all the yeast uh, start up immediately on glucose. The real lag phase actually starts, and this is only 10% of the word, eh? so 10, 15%. So this is very fast. Normally, it's already gone within half a day or a day. Then the transfer from glucose to maltose, that's where the real lag phase normally is. Some yeast, even in a monoculture, if you have a pure culture, still some of the yeast inside can be faster than others in starting up this maltose metabolism. That's what we saw, you know, at university. Uh, maybe I can show a clip on that in a, in a, in a, in a, in the next webinar how that works. Um, and then once you have a few guys that started up, the others follow quite quickly, but there's still some delay. And why that is, we don't know actually. Why some yeasts are faster in picking up and, and going from glucose to maltose meta metabolism than others. It's uh, it's 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 really an academic subject uh, at this point in, in time. Um, if you start aerobically, uh, normally you don't have any lag phase because, as I just mentioned, you mainly focus on energy, producing a lot of energy, and make biomass for growth. So you just you're not making ethanol, you're not making beer, you're making biomass in, in, in aerobic conditions. Um, once the, the oxygen has been used, it has to enter. That has been vacuum packed. It is entering aerobic phase. And then it has to switch on the whole anaerobic metabolism to go into fermented fermentation phase. So uh, both are possible. Um, if you talk to a maltster, for instance, they will always say, yeah, you have to oxygenate the word. Um, oxygenation of the word can have some benefit, you know, in, uh, in, in removing, um, uh, you know, some undesired compounds. Uh, um, if you look strictly on, on, on the fermentation side of things, you don't need it. Um, if you prefer doing it, go ahead. Uh, in the end, what counts is uh, is the beer and the beer, the, the flavor profile of the beer that that you like. It's um, does that answer your question, Timion? Okay. So, I think then we are done. Alar, you you want to add something? <laughs> <laughs> no, not much. So if you have uh, time to 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 uh, complete the question, that would be great. If you have questions, uh, you can always contact uh, Alar or, or me. Also, other questions. Um, if you want to try things, you know, it's, uh, we are always open uh, 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 for trials and and stuff like that. So. I hope then to see you next week, same time, uh, where we will talk about um, the difference between rehydrating versus direct pitching of yeast and what's that doing to the kinetics and the and the flavor profile. And if you if you join again, you will see we will go more and more and more into details on uh, on what exactly happens in in your fermenter and how you can steer 
your fermentation by changing simple parameters like the temperature or the pitching rate or the gravity and what that's doing to the flavor profile uh, if obviously you use one of our yeasts so thanks a lot hope to see you uh, next week and Allah will send again around uh, a new uh, invitation uh, with a new link because uh, all the webinars are recorded so there will be a new link uh, because every webinar has its own link okay yes thank you Gina okay you're welcome and see you next week see you <laughs>